Well, welcome back to another recording of Life and Doctrine. For you, it's been a week. For me, it's been about two minutes for me walking over and clicking the stop and go button. And we are ready to do part two of spiritual gifts. So last week, we talked about the revelatory gifts where divine revelation is given to people and there's various spiritual gifts, maybe the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, getting insight into the nature of the new covenant. There's prophecy, the ability to prophetically preach divine revelation that's given. We talked about uh, why these gifts have served their purpose and they're no more. And then we talked about the confirmatory gifts, and these are various miraculous healing kind of gifts that confirmed by those who God gave those gifts to. They confirmed the preaching of the gospel that these people had received from Jesus himself. They served a confirmatory role as they handed over the baton of the gospel to the next generation. And we read Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 3 and 4, which shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that it had a confirmatory role. And once that confirmatory role was established and the church had received and believed and the church was launched, then you can take off the scaffolding of these confirmatory gifts and they're no longer needed. And we talked about the fact that clearly God can, can and does do miracles, can and does miraculously heal, heal people, do whatever he wants. But as far as strategic spiritual gifts that God gives to someone upon their being born again, those gifts have served their purpose. So the gifts that we're going to get into uh, this, this afternoon are the two, um, two last categories. The first one is speaking gifts, okay? First category is speaking gifts. And the first spiritual gift here would be evangelism. <coughs> Excuse me. So now this can, this can provide us an escape. If someone says, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism, therefore I want to evangelize, that is not at all what the Bible is talking about. We are all commanded, based on the Great Commission, right, to go into all the world and to preach the gospel in our own Jerusalem, support missionaries who do that. So we are always to be presenting the gospel to people. But there are some people that God has given, and remember, spiritual gifts are not like natural talents and natural abilities, not like a personality test or something. They are supernaturally empowered um, skills, aptitudes that God has given a person. So the gift of evangelism is someone that God has supernaturally empowered to um, boldly come to an unbeliever and to wisely and graciously share the gospel and it seems to be also in scripture and i'll tell you the reason why in a second that the person with the spiritual gift of evangelism also enjoys seeing people come to christ now we know that salvation is not the job of the evangelist Success evangelism is any time the gospel is shared. But it seems to be in Scripture that when God gives the spiritual gift of evangelism, he also decrees that he is going to use that spiritually gifted person to lead people to Christ. Okay, And the reason we say that is because the only example in the Bible we are given of the person with the gift of evangelism is Philip in the book of Acts. And Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch. And so uh, Philip was a church planter, right? Philip um, would go to various places. He would preach the gospel. People would respond, and he planted churches there. So and some of the really uh, trustworthy books that I've read, they have sort of derived from that, that those with the spiritual gift of evangelism are often associated or maybe should be associated with a, with a church plant or at least involved in the and the building up of the church because God has chosen to use them to lead people to Christ. And so I say that, I kind of put that out there knowing that Philip is our example, not to discourage anyone who loves to evangelize, but just has never seen anyone genuinely repent under their evangelistic ministry. Uh, don't let that discourage you. Continue to preach. Salvation belongs to the Lord. But I'm just telling you what the only example we have in Scripture is those who have that gift um, are used by God to build up the church. So pray to that end. But that's the gift of evangelism. Um, and then th we have the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching is simply the ability to clarify truth and to convey truth to the people. 
Now, it's more than just being clear because an atheist can be clear about truth that he doesn't really believe in. But it's a spiritual insight that requires, you know, they always say a good teacher has to know the audience. Well, a good teacher who's filled with the Spirit understands the audience of believers, understands the audience of unbelievers, and he is able to speak with a kind of clarity that is very effective to the onlooking audience. I praise the Lord. One of the most frequent compliments I receive is, you made that truth so clear. I was always confused about that, and now it's just very clear in my mind. And I'm always encouraged when I hear that, because obviously I believe that God has given me the gift of teaching. I'm a pastor teacher. And so when difficult truths are clarified and the light bulb goes on for God's people, I just see the Spirit of God using me in that particular way. So that is the gift of teaching, the ability to clearly convey. It's not the ability to rivet people and tell amazing stories and, and make people laugh. And none of that has anything to do with the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching is to clearly communicate the Word of God. And then there's the gift of exhortation. And a gift of exhortation is taking the word of God and powerfully applying it to the need. So it can refer to a person who's deeply discouraged and you take the word of God and you say, hey, brother, sister, this is what the word of God says. And I want you to know you have hope. I think you've taken your eyes off the hope and you have hope. Look at Christ. Look at his beauty. Look at the people who've gone before you. You have a way of, of framing the truth to that person that strengthens them. Now, obviously, it's very possible for the person with the gift of exhortation to talk to someone who's just belligerent and unteachable, and we wouldn't want you to walk away and say, maybe I don't have the gift of exhortation. There's always hard-hearted people out there that no amount of spiritual gifting upon them is going to make a difference. But you'll, and we'll get into this a little bit, but you'll be able to look at the trajectory, you'll be able to look at your track record and see that, yes, God is using me with the gift of exhortation. It could also be in the negative, it could be confronting. A lot of exhortation in the scripture is sort of standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone and say, look, I love you, brother, but I think you're headed down a dangerous path. And you're able to convey truth in such a way that really articulates the dangerous path that they're on and exhorts them to come back to the straight and narrow. So that's the gift of exhortation. So you can see there that it's not merely a talent, but there needs to be a spiritual awareness and a spiritual aptitude to discern the need and to speak to the need. So these are very, very spirit-empowered things we are talking about. We're not just talking about human talent, so to speak. And then there's the gift of pastor-teacher. And the gift of pastor-teacher um, is the gift to teach, okay? So it possesses that. But the word pastor comes obviously from the word shepherd, and it refers to the posture of someone's heart. So um, a shepherd looks over his sheep with love and tenderness and care. He knows when to be tough. He knows when to be merciful. So there's this warm-hearted tenderness upon a pastor. I remember Mark Dever saying, you know, if, if you're in a meeting, and um, maybe it's an elders meeting, or maybe it's just a meeting of up-and-coming leaders, and there's a couple in that meeting who are really asserting themselves and trying to show that they're, they're the strong voice in the room, he said, there's a very good chance they don't have the heart of the pastor. But the person who sits there quietly and the person who affirms the statements of wise men in the room, the person who's not putting themselves forward but simply has a tender and compassionate heart, they don't, they don't need to be the big presence in the room. He said, there is the heart of the pastor. There is the heart of someone who's looking back and he's sort of looking over the situation and what is channeling his thoughts is a compassionate, tender, shepherding heart for the people. Um, so the gift of pastor teacher is to teach out of that kind of heart. And so God gives um, some people those gifts. Um, so those are the speaking gifts, okay? And then the last category is the support gifts or the help gifts. So you say, I don't think God's you know, gifted me in any way to teach or to preach or to clarify or to exhort. Now remember, I think every husband, every head of every home should be able to teach. It doesn't mean he has to have the spiritual gift, but you better be able to open the Bible and have a devotional time, right? Uh, that is honoring to God. Um, evangelism, you don't have to have the spiritual gift, but everybody should be evangelizing, right? So 
just because we don't have the gift doesn't mean we have nothing to do with teaching per se. Um, but if you think, you know, I just know the Lord hasn't gifted me in any of these teaching ways, well, here's three other gifts that remain. The gift of help, okay? Now, the gift of help is the supernatural ability God has given some of his children to discern the weakness in another person. Now, not like pointing out the flaws, but what is causing them to limp? What is causing them to be downtrodden and discouraged and, and weighed down with the burdens of life? And so they're able to discern that much more quickly than other people without the gift could. But here's the important thing. They also know how to meet it. Because many people can point out a weakness, but few people can tenderly meet that. That's one of the things I love about being a part of a local church. Because as much as I try to help people in various ways, I don't believe that I possess the spiritual gift of perceiving a weakness and then perceiving the most effective way to meet that weakness in that person's life. But then I'll stand shoulder to shoulder with someone who has that gift and they're able to see it. And they're able to see, boy, they're, they're really weighed down with their children. And you know, I just heard so-and-so say that uh, they would love to come alongside some young people and maybe take them out a couple times a month for ice cream and see what they're, well, what they're reading in the Bible and how they're growing in the Lord. And that would be such a great encouragement to those uh, parents. Or maybe there's a single mom out there struggling. You're able to discern and not only just kind of sympathize from a distance, you're able to think of a way that would be a, a real relief and a real help to her. And I love to see those people because I sit back and think, man, I would have never observed that. I would have never thought of that kind of solution, that kind of help. But that's great. And it's the body of Christ. I see the Spirit of God showing his power in just another different way in, a, in another person. Um, so that's the gift of help, being able to perceive a weakness and being able to perceive how to meet that weakness. And even as I'm talking, the names of various people in Berean are coming to my mind. They do it like, like breathing. It's just natural to them because God's given them that ability, and I thank the Lord for it. And then there is the spiritual gift of showing mercy. Now, showing mercy is recognizing pain in people. So it's kind of like help where there's a weakness, but it's recognizing pain and hurts in people and how to alleviate the pain and the hurt. Now, again, there's some people who hurt, and you try to help them all you can, and they don't want to be helped. That doesn't mean you don't have the spiritual gift. It just means there's some people who just refuse to be, um, you know, they, they don't let people reach out to them. They refuse to be helped by the body of Christ. But this is someone who can discern the pain in another person. But again, because this person with the spiritual gift of mercy is in the word and they're walking with the Lord, they're letting the word of Christ dwell in them richly, they're able to understand how can I help with this pain. Now, it might be in a uh, conveying biblical truth to them, or it could be in a material way. It could be um, giving of your time and energy, whatever it might be, but you're, you're meeting and helping alleviate that pain. You're lightening the load. And then the third... Um, spiritual gift in this category, there's 17 spiritual gifts in total, is uh, the gift of giving, okay? So this is the spiritual ability to see um, that a person is lacking in some way. And it might be material. Uh, there's plenty of ways that a person could be lacking. And so it's coming alongside them with time, with money, with skill, whatever it might be, and again, meeting that need. So the gift of help, showing mercy, giving, you know, all those gifts kind of overlap. And you have to, um, if you listen to my sermon on 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and you go through the spiritual gift, I really nuance and show you the different verses so they don't blur all together. They're, they're very distinct. Um, when we recognize hurt or pain or weakness in another person, we might be the one that God is calling to meet that need. But very often, and this is something I've learned just from being a part of a healthy local church, is that the person with the gift of mercy, they might see the pain in the other person, but also know they're not the best person to meet that need. But they know of this person over here, maybe similar life circumstances, or maybe their particular area of giftedness would just be uh, a perfect lock-in with this person who's hurting. 
And so they will actually pick up the phone or they'll go out and they'll help orchestrate so that this need is met and they stay behind the scenes. So it's not only, not always the person with the spiritual gift of help or the spiritual gift of mercy, the spiritual gift uh, of giving that is the one who meets the need. But they see the need and they're able to orchestrate and see that that particular need is met and the burden on that person is lightened by their involvement. And so those are the different ways um, those are the different ways that um, God has equipped us. And I actually forgot the very last spiritual gift, which is governing. And it can also be called administration, okay? Now, again, this is one of those gifts that people, uh, you know, if they're a pastor or someone on their elder board has an entrepreneurial business spirit, they say, oh, look, it's the, it's the spiritual gift of administration. And we need to be very careful because under that definition, people, again, who do not have the spirit, who are atheistic, can be brilliant when it comes to administrating. Now, you need some administrative common sense, obviously, to, to be able to uh, run a church and make, thing, make sure that things run smoothly. But that is not what the Scripture is talking about. Let me read to you from my research of Scripture what I believe the spiritual gift, and I call it the spiritual gift of governing, okay, because it sounds less like administrating. The gift of governing is the spiritually spirit-given ability to communicate wise information by the way that we speak, by the way that we live, to those under your influence for the purpose of harmoniously pursuing a biblical task. It's the ability to communicate wise information by the way that we live, by the way that we speak. We communicate wise information to the people under our influence to achieve a spiritual, biblical task. And I've really seen this over my years at Berean. I've seen uh, people who do a wonderful job. They're, they're leading, they're orchestrating a particular ministry. There's a lot of people who respect them under their influence, and they do a wonderful job. Um, and then I see other people come in who, who do the same thing, but instead their governance is weighed down with spiritual insight and spiritual principles and spiritual burdens. Um, so whether it's children's ministry or whether it's community groups or whatever it might be, it's not merely organizational, but it's mobilizing and organizing for the purpose of achieving spiritual goals. And you can tell when that person uh, is driven by spiritual goals, not to just run or administrate a ministry so it's a well-oiled machine, but there are uh, there's a deep, heavy heart, heavy burden they have uh, for the people there, and therefore the decisions that they make, they make out of sympathy and love and compassion for the people that they're ministering to. I've seen administrative ideas that have been recommended that I think on paper sound really great, but they might be a little um, heavy-handed for the people. And then I've seen other administrative decisions that uh, maybe in the business world would uh, not be the most efficient way to go about it, but they are the best shepherding way to go about it. They are the most caring way for the sake of of the well-being of the people. So the way administration operates in a church is obviously not the way it operates in the world. It's not a dog-eat-dog -dog <laughs> kind of competition in the local church. Uh, the people are the goal. The ministry is not the goal. The people are the goal. So the ministry is only so valuable insofar as the people are being edified. Ministry should never steamroll over people. And the person who has the spiritual gift there values the person first. They value big principles like discipleship and encouragement and exhortation. And they see ministry as sort of a means to those biblical ends. Obviously, that should be the mindset of everyone, but the person with that kind of administrating, governing spiritual gift, um, they just breathe that kind of insight. And I praise God for that particular gift. So, let me end by suggesting to you practically how does a person go about um, discovering their spiritual gift. What I would recommend 
is you begin now to pick a ministry based upon a particular spiritual gift. So if you think I might have the gift of teaching, whether it's children or men's or women's Bible study, I might have a gift of teaching, then talk to the Sunday school coordinator, talk to um, someone overseeing that particular ministry and say, you know, for the next six months, year, I want to try my hand. <laughs> and these ministries are very important, so they're always qualified ministries. But I want to try my hand at teaching, and I want to see how effective I am at teaching the Word of God. And then do that and see if your ministry bears fruit. There was um, a person a while back um, who took over a particular uh, Sunday school class, and it went from just this you know, tiny little Sunday school class to really growing, but not only numerically growing, which we understand that you can do a bad job and something can numerically grow. So that's not always evidence of the good. The growth in the early church in the book of Acts, that was a good numeric growth. But not only was this particular Sunday school class growing under this person who was newer to teaching, but I kept and continue to hear a lot of feedback from the parents on how effective and how meaningful the study has been to their children. Um, so as I step back and look at that, I say clearly this person has the spiritual gift of teaching, it would seem, because you're, you're seeing the ministry thrive, you're seeing fruits abound. And so um, as you try your hand at various ministries that uh, focus on different spiritual gifts, you look back, and, and not only yourself assessing yourself, because we can be overly critical of ourselves, or we can have blind spots and think we're better than we really are, but asking those who are around us, um, how effective do you think I am? I mean, tell me honestly, because I'm trying to find my spiritual gift here. Uh, is, is it just clicking? Does it just make sense? Do you see effectiveness and fruit? Or maybe I should keep looking. Uh, to find a friend who can be that honest with us, maybe it's a spouse sitting in with us, is a real treasure. Um, so that might be something in teaching. You could, you could teach in Sunday school, Awana, whatever. Evangelism. Maybe you have the gift of evangelism and you haven't overcome your fear yet to really understand if you do have the gift of evangelism. Well, just about every week at Berean, we have people that go out and we evangelize. So contact me. Uh, Brian James is one of those who goes out frequently. Um, you contact someone in the church and go out and um, talk to people and evangelize. There's the gift of exhortation. Uh, spiritual gifts like this, I won't go through all these, but exhortation, help, showing mercy, giving, things like that are not necessarily ministries that come with a label. In order to find out if you are gifted in that area, you simply have to start getting to know people um, or start working with the people that you already know. So start having people over for dinner or start getting together with someone for coffee and just ask a few questions. Hey, how's your life going? I know we all have your, our own set of problems, and you know you don't have to tell me everything. I'm not prying. I just want to be able to pray for you. What are some things that are going on? See what they say, and then think about it, pray about it, think about some passages that apply to their situation. Get together with them and exhort them in the Word, or see if you can meet a, a mercy need or a help need. And as you... And, and we can uh, refine our gifts, too. And it's not like if, if we feel we fail the first time, I definitely don't have that. That's why I say to pick something and really work at it for a series of months and see if after a while it really starts clicking and God begins to really bear great fruit in those particular ministries. Um, the gift of pastor-teacher. If you think maybe God's calling me to do this, maybe he's calling me not just to teach, but to do more preaching. Well, I would say this is such a, this is such a strategic gift for the local church that you want to get together with an elder, uh, ideally the pastor teacher, and you want to start going through a book, uh, Am I Called to Ministry? And, and what is preaching? And to, and to explore these things and maybe shadow the pastor around. That would be me. Shadow me around. Maybe sit in some uh, counseling sessions and kind of get your hands dirty and get, get the feel of what it means to, uh, to be a pastor and explore that. That would be an absolutely wonderful thing to investigate. The gift of governing. Maybe you could come alongside someone who's already overseeing a particular ministry, and you could say, hey, you know, I, I think I'm pretty good at governing and administrating things, but I know the spiritual gift. 
there's a lot more uh, principle and insight than just mere organization. So I want to make sure I have a spiritual gift. And the pastor told me that he believes you have that gift. And I want to come alongside you and just kind of shadow you and maybe give you some insight. And over time, you could um, kind of groom me or give me some feedback and let me know if you think I'm gifted in this particular area. And I think if we go through that maybe difficult and uncomfortable work of just putting ourselves in different places to see what our spiritual gift is, if we go through that, then God is definitely going to answer our prayer because we're pursuing his will, right? This is what delights God. And God is going to bless us. God's going to answer our prayer. And in the long run, we're going to know exactly what we're gifted for, exactly what we're called to do. We'll be able to throw ourselves into a particular ministry that really um, needs our spiritual gifting, and we're going to have that peace of mind that this is what God designed me for. I think that's so important. So again, any way that we serve, any way that we minister, we do with the heart of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit, is pleasing and acceptable and very much needed before God. Um, if you're a Berean, you know that one of our favorite things to do here is to tear down and set up chairs because we have a multi-purpose gym slash sanctuary to tear down tables and well that's a huge ministry well obviously you don't need a spiritual gift to do that but it's meeting a huge need so there's many things in the church that just need uh, people to serve and to labor and god absolutely delights in it but beyond all that for you as an individual there is a particular gift that god has gifted you with and he wants you to know it and he wants you to pursue it with all your heart